we're in the midst of a perfect storm. Now, this storm isn't due to weather patterns or global warming, but rather over the past 40 years to rapidly increasing levels of antibiotic resistance, devastatingly coupled with an equally dramatic drop in the number of new drugs that make it to the market. Now, the outcome of this storm isn't going to be a single lost ship at sea. Potentially millions of people will die of infectious disease. Now, this isn't just my opinion. This serious threat is no longer a prediction for the future. It's happening right now in every region of the world, and it has the potential to affect anyone, any of you, at any age, even in your 20s, in any country. Antibiotic resistance is now a major threat to public health. Now, depressing as this news is, and I do understand it gets depressing to think about it, I'm an optimist. And I like to think about the fact that it also offers us an opportunity to radically rethink how we do things, radically transform the antibiotic arsenal for the 21st century. Now, with the discovery of penicillin and the 40 years of subsequent drug development, they changed the life of infectious disease on this planet. Millions of people were saved. The average life expectancy increased 30 years. Truly, these are and were miracle drugs. But we paid a steep price for our sole reliance on these broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, broad spectrum means exactly that. They were chosen by pharmaceutical companies because they killed the breadth of human pathogens. Now, you'd think, that's a great idea, except for the fact that we are comprised of trillions of microbial cells. As you learned earlier, nine out of every 10 cells in your body is microbial. And when we take an antibiotic, we are devastating that microbiome. In addition, as we take our drugs, we're selecting for resistance, ever increasing levels of antibiotic resistance. Just as the microbes provided solutions to our infectious disease problem in the early 20th century, and that was through the discovery of penicillin and, and its derivatives, they are similarly poised to help us out of this problem. But we have to be prepared to change our vision. The way microbes communicate, the way they interact, is nothing like the broad spectrum drugs that we've usurped for human health. Their approach is much more like a guided missile. They target and destroy specifically. Now, all of you have E. coli in your gut right now. Here's one of those E. coli. What in the world is a guided missile from a microbial point of view? Well, they actually look pretty nasty. Here's a bacteriophage. This is like a self-replicating smart bomb. It is capable of targeting and destroying single strains. My own favorite, bactericin proteins. These are produced when life gets stressful and the cell says, SOS, this is not good. What am I going to do? They produce these proteins, and those kill other members of their own species. Or pheromones. These are signals. These are ways for bacteria to communicate. And in a population, when cell densities increase, they release these pheromones, which interact very precisely with members of their own species, and suggest collective, we have to do something. Times are getting stressful. Now, you're going to learn just a little bit about my favorite, these bactericins. But before we dive in to their biology, I want to prove to you that, in fact, bacteria do prefer blondes, or in this case, bactericins. And we'll do that by plotting on this phylogeny of bacteria. Those lineages that produce conventional broad-spectrum antibiotics versus the everyone who's anyone that produces bactericins. From an evolutionary perspective, it doesn't take statistics to see who wins. I'm a microbial ecologist and an evolutionary biologist by training. And much of my past 30 years has been out looking for these things, these bactericins, finding them, naming them, characterizing them, categorizing them, and cajoling the bacteria into occasionally telling me a little bit about what they do in nature. And so here's a population of E. coli, same ones that are in your gut making you healthy. But in this case, we have a green lineage and an orange lineage. 
Members of the green lineage are essentially like brothers and sisters. Members in the orange lineage are like my distant relatives. They're more like cousins or uncles or great uncles. Now, a new cell enters this community and senses, oh, it's getting dense here. This isn't good. And so it produces bactericins, which results in its own death. Can't seem like a good idea, right? But what happens is those bactericins then collide with other cells in the population and rapidly eliminate them. The end result, the green cells increase at the expense of the orange cells. It's a form of bacterial altruism. A few individuals kill themselves, releasing proteins so that others in the community can survive. But how in the world do these proteins do it? How do they know it was an orange cell? They're all the same species, right? So let's go to the orange cell and blow up its cell membrane. There it is, a beautiful lipid bilayer. And in that lipid bilayer, the blue ovals, which are flashing, are cell surface receptors. These actually allow the cell to take things in from the outside. Bactericins have evolved to recognize those. And they say, oh, it's got the blue oval. Sweet. Now it's held up close to the cell, and it can do its job, which in this case is to stick itself in like a hairpin, and all the guts come out. A gory death is had by all. So clearly, these are a great evolutionary invention, right? But the point was, Peg, can we use them to solve this perfect storm, this dilemma we find ourselves in? And I'm here to tell you yes. And to prove this, I'm going to tell you two stories. The first one's taking place in your own backyard. Have you heard of the company Immucel? If you haven't, look it up. Immucel is the first and currently the only company in the US that is using these molecules, bactericins, to treat infectious disease. They're focusing on veterinary applications. So to tell you more about Immucel, I have to introduce you to one of my favorites, the dairy cow. These hardworking moms produce babies and milk, lots and lots of milk. They are incredibly susceptible to a nasty pathogen that causes mastitis, an inflammation of the mammary tissues. We don't have any good drugs to treat mastitis. Now that turns out to be a real bummer because we often have to cull the individuals because it's infectious. About 12 years ago, the CSO of Immucel came to me and said, Peg, you know, you're my bactericin gal. I'm going to start a company and we're going we're, we're gonna to treat mastitis with bactericins. What do you think? Well, I had just moved from Yale and my head was spinning. I was opening boxes. I was interviewing new students. And I said, oh, Joe, great idea. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> so he went and he did it. Oh my god, he did it. So he came back just about a year ago and said, Peg, check this out. Wipe out. These are basically baby wipes with one of my bactericins. I'm very possessive of them. It wasn't mine. It was his. He used a bactericin, impregnated these wipes, and you basically just use these wipes before hooking up the dairy cow to the milking machine. And what does he do? It turns out to be a very good idea. It's like just disinfecting 99% of all the strains that cause mastitis. Better yet, it's non-toxic and non-inflammatory. These cows are smiling when they leave his milking machine. So I'm really thrilled to say that Immucel has gone even further and they're at the tail end of an FDA process in which an injectable form of this same bactericin is going to be used in at the heart of the infection in the mammary tissues to eliminate it. They hope to have drug approval by the end of 2016. And for those of you from the Portland area, open up your newspapers over the next few weeks because you're soon going to see an announcement. Immucel and Peg Riley's team down at UMass have partnered. I'm thrilled to say that over the last year, some great results have occurred in that area too. Now, to tell you that story, I have to take you to Beijing. And here we are in the Forbidden City, Peg and Dr. Chu. Xiao Jing Chu contacted me about a year ago. Dr. Chu created the Pheromonison Biotech Company, and he challenged himself, this was about 15 years ago, to take that one bactericin that was evolved by E. coli to kill E. coli, and he said, I'm going to retarget it. 
for all human pathogens. That's no small feat. So first he looked at MRSA. And at that time, they had just discovered the pheromones that MRSA produces. And those are these little things I've shown you that recognize a pheromone cell surface receptor. Dr. Chu tried something that shouldn't have worked. He said, let me put that pheromone on the tail end, the business end, of my bactericin. This construct, which he called a pheromonicin, then allowed the pheromone to bring his toxin up close and personal with the target cell, and voila, pores were formed, cells were dead. He infected mice with MRSA, but then he saved every last one by injecting his pheromonicin. Better yet, he poured this drug on human cell tissue. No toxicity, no inflammation. Now that's a pretty good thing. So he said, let's try it again. Enterococcus. You've all heard of vancomycin resistant enterococcus. That's what I've got here. Well, it turns out they produce pheromones, but pheromones that will only recognize other enterococcus, just like that. And he said, well, it happened once. Let's give it a try. Yep. Now he's got a protein that evolved over hundreds of millions of years to form a pore in an E. coli cell membrane that turns around and forms a pore in a gram-positive cell membrane. I know there's one microbiologist in this audience, I met her earlier, and she's saying, there is no way that happened. Those things are so different, right? You're here, right? Well, it did. And I'm gonna explain why. It's so cool, it's physics. We have to look at the gecko to understand it. So here's our gecko, these adorable little reptiles. They are like Spider-Man, right? They can run up glass, hang upside down, they just do everything. Well, they do it because they've got these cute little foot pads, but actually they do it because of the law of physics. These little foot pads get up close to the glass and there's an intermolecular attraction and it has a name, the guy who invented it, Van der Waal. It's the Van der Waal zone. And it's about five angstroms. And once you get two things within five angstrom, they can't help it, they love each other, right? They just suck together. Well, what was happening was those pheromones were bringing the bactericin up within the Van der Waal zone. Well, then the bactericin didn't have any choice. It was a lipid bilayer, I gotta do my job. I'm gonna form a pore. Pretty sweet, huh? Now some of you have already thought ahead and you said, lipid bilayers. What else has a lipid bilayer? Hmm, let me think. Enveloped viruses. They have lipid bilayers. Yeah, we got a lot of viruses we can't treat. Fungi, they have lipid bilayers. Human cancer cells, they have lipid bilayers. Let's turn to a fungus, Canada albicans. This is a human commensal. It causes all kinds of opportunistic infections. Well, they also produce pheromones. These ones are sex pheromones. So it gets kinky, a little X-rated. I won't show you, though. I'll just tell you. Dr. Chu attached the fungal pheromone to a bactericin and said, I'm going to just give it a shot. And you already know the answer, right? Did it work? Oh, yeah. It's rocking. Not only that, but it's being tested to treat rice-based blight. Two years in the field and this stuff is working. This is one of the coolest new antifungal you'll have ever heard about, and it's working. Okay, so we're gonna look at one more opportunity for pheromonocins, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV. Now, this is a herpes virus. It's, in fact, the most common herpes virus in humans. There are no vaccines, there are no antivirals, there are no drugs to treat this. Doctors have been working very hard to find and develop antibodies to the envelope, which is this lipid bilayer around the, the nuclear guts. And so if we take that and chop it down to its smallest size, so it won't interfere with my important bactericin's function, and you attach it, it recognizes the virus, forms a poor, dead virus. Epstein-Barr virus infects human cells and forms all kinds of things like Burkitt's lymphoma. These are cells 
with, that were infected with EBV. And once they're infected, their lipid bilayer now has signatures of EBV. And if you have an antibody that will recognize those signatures, you can bring your bacteria in, form pores, and they penetrate the tumors. Now, you can see why I call this a drug platform. I can target specifically bacteria. I can target fungi. I can target viruses. I can target human cancer cells. Well, the future for this drug is really bright. The Beijing Economic Zone has committed well over 200 million US dollars to bringing pheromonocins to the next level. They've created the Pheromonocin Institute in Beijing that Dr. Chu will run. They've invited me to make the sister institute in my own backyard, Western Mass. Our sole focus is going to bring some 22 different bacteriocin-based products to the market as soon as possible because we desperately need them. So let's get back to the depressing part, the perfect storm. That's where we started. And what I've shown you are two different companies that are using these wacko ideas of proteins, biologics, for use instead of broad spectrum antibiotics. Shouldn't work, couldn't work, right? It does. The problem isn't with good ideas. It rarely is in this country. We have lots of them. And what I've shown you are just the things I know about. The real problem is funding. Very few large pharmaceutical companies still are in the business of making antibiotics. I find this particularly ironic because right now, two of the largest pharma companies that were still in the business just this month left the playing field, Merck and AstraZeneca. Now at the same time, our president announced this as a national priority and put $1.2 billion into solving this challenge. And I'm thrilled that he did that. It brought it to the forefront. However, how much does it take to create one drug? $1.5 billion. I think of the situation we're in is very similar to what the Red Queen said to Alice when she was being dragged through looking glass land. We are running as fast as we can to keep in the same place. The pharma companies have left the building. The funding levels are ridiculously low for something that's going to kill you. I hope, though, I've left you with some optimism. Because there are small companies, underfunded as they are, that are willing to try to take these ideas from wacko, crazy notions to actually, like Immucel, putting them out in the dairy farm, or actually, like Pheromonison, putting them out in the rice field. And that's the future of drug discovery in this next century. So I'm going to end with a quote from one of my favorite authors, Lewis Thomas. Disease usually results from inconclusive negotiations for symbiosis an overstepping of the line by one side or the other, a biological misinterpretation of the borders. Isn't that beautiful? But what it means is we've got to think differently about infectious disease. Very few of those microbes are even interested in us. Some of them are extraordinarily important for us to survive. And just rarely do they misinterpret the borders, if you will. And rather than try to wipe them off the face of this planet, we should step back and remember they are our fellow travelers. They are your most intimate friends. Thank you.